Hello, and welcome back to Bob Dylan's Song by Song. You are looking at one of the most iconic album covers of all time. That's not just my opinion. It is for Dylan's breakout album, 1963's The Free Will and Bob Dylan, but we are concerned with the opening track, Blowing in the Wind, which was, as fate would have it, his breakout song. So, first song on your first album of original material, and it's without question a masterpiece and a timeless classic. This put him on the map, especially in terms of songwriting. It kind of announced him as the the new kid on the block, you know, the new talent to watch out for in that regard. In case all of that wasn't enough, what it really did was go on to be the consensus pick as the greatest protest song of all time. Stevie Wonder is just one of countless legends, really, who've done this song, both live and on record. There was a veritable explosion of recordings of this song in the 60s, most famously by Peter, Paul, and Mary, whose cover turned into a massive hit. It was kind of almost the heralding of Dylan's presence as a songwriter. And back then in the industry, you know, those are saying, singers come and go, but songs are forever. That's where the money was really at, and Dylan is easily as responsible as anybody for completely changing that dynamic. He and others, but especially he, gave birth to this new paradigm that has never ended, where the songs are inextricably linked to the person who created them, the world of the singer-songwriter. And this song was a huge step in that direction. But as you can see with these visuals, it was born in the old era, so it had kind of one foot in, one foot out. On to the song itself. This is an amazing piece of work in all respects, not just the writing, but his singing on you know his version, the original version. I think lists of greatest songs, albums, etc. are stupid, but I'll cite one anyway. Uh, Rolling Stone ranked this as the 14th greatest song of all time, and I note that just to give an indication of you know the effect that it's had, and that list was compiled in recent years. So what makes it so great? Uh, I think the structure is a huge part of it, the words of course, but if you think about the song, it's this list of questions, this litany of questions, and they're all posed, see that in the bold there, then the refrain always comes in, and it's an ambiguous answer. The answer isn't peace, the answer isn't love, the answer isn't stop the war, you know, whatever war you're thinking of. The answer's elusive, and we don't even know if we can ever get a hold of it. So many protest or anthemic inspirational songs promise something, maybe a specific answer, or at least that things are going to change, that there's going to be a day of reckoning, and this one does not at all, and the repetition reinforces that. Like Song to Woody, which we covered last time, this song has a really rigid structure. It's always three questions that rhyme, followed by the non-answer. There's much more to it than that. Notice that the first question of every stanza is kind of an abstract question, followed by particular evils or problems. How many years can a mountain exist before it's washed to the sea? That's a little bit more abstract than how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free. Without question, people in the early 60s would have thought of that in terms of the African-American struggle. And that's one of the brilliant things about the song. Even when it gets specific, it doesn't get very specific. It stays vague enough that you can apply the statement to struggles from decades later, which is exactly what's been done with the song over and over again. That's probably the key to the song's enduring nature. Not only can it apply to one kind of struggle across time, but to different kinds of struggles across time on top of that. Let's try to briefly touch on how deft Dylan's use of language is in this song. For me in particular, it's about how he manages to pack so much symbolism and meaning into so few words. So look at this first stanza, it's really sparse. The first couplet is going to make you think of African-American civil rights struggles. You know, famously a black man would be called a boy by a racist. But it's still indirect enough to apply to other things. Really any struggle where a man is not being given the full dignity that he deserves. And then the next two questions work really well together, and they're more specific because it's all about peace and war. Look how much there is going on here. First, there's the alliteration. I count eight S sounds in the line, yes, and how many seas must a white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? The next line doesn't have that, but notice it has the exact same rhythm, yes, and how many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? And in the first line of the two that we're considering here, how many seas must a white dove sail? Like, those are the two peaks. Same thing below with how many times must the cannonballs fly? Professor Christopher Ricks talks about how a lot of times Dylan's songs allow you to match things up not just phonetically, like they rhyme in terms of sound, but also metaphorically. Or they're juxtaposed in interesting ways, and you can definitely see that here. Notice, just even visually there on the page, the white dove is juxtaposed with the cannonball. Well, it's a white dove. He spells that out. That's the symbol of peace. A cannonball we know is black, so he doesn't have to say the black cannonball. So they're visually opposites and metaphorically, because the white dove is the Christian symbol of peace, and a cannonball is being used here as a symbol of war. And they're both flying or sailing through the air. An interesting 
You could have it either way, right? You just didn't want to use the same word twice. Well, why couldn't the cannonball sail through the air? It could. And why couldn't the white dove fly? But using sail, the verb for the dove, is better because a dove sailing over the sea and looking for land, of course, reminds you of Noah's Ark. Noah released the dove to look for land after the flood. So Noah was sailing when he released the dove. The line about the dove can now be interpreted as, literally, when will there be peace on earth? Because the dove is a symbol of peace, and it is looking to come down to find the beach at the end of the ocean, the sand. Sand rhymes with band phonetically, and, you know, in terms of meaning as well, because the dove landing in the sand is the equivalent of a cannibal being banned. Peace and peace. In other words, an end to war. So these two lines ask, when will there be an end to war? And of course the answer is uncertain because the refrain comes in and the answer is blown in the wind. But wait, there's more. Notice in all three parts of that stanza, you have an object and then it's traveling. So the man is walking down the road, the dove is sailing through the air, and the cannonball is flying. And of course there's internal rhyming because it's Dylan. So, you know, before they're forever banned, before they're four. Which is also part of the refrain, of course, like, blow in in the wind, blow in in the wind. That's three times, which also matches the three times in the refrain, you know, end, friend. The answer, my friend, is blown in the wind, the answer is blown in the wind. So you have that sound three times as well, so two sets of three, if you will. And it's not just that it has those two sets of sounds, but they work together. In fact, they come together on the predominant word of the entire song, wind. Right? It has win, so it rhymes with the in. And N-D, wind, so it rhymes with friend. It doesn't literally rhyme with two different sounds, that'd be impossible, but you can see how it incorporates both. There's just so much to notice in the Dylan song if you take the time to really look into it. That's all I'm trying to get across here. A question that comes up a lot regarding all of this is, was this done on purpose? It's a misguided question. It's like asking if all the things you can notice in a, you know, a Picasso painting were intentional. What's relevant is that, going back to Dylan, these kinds of tricks, the complexity, the layered nature of the... Wordplay exists throughout his entire career, but technical wizardry alone does not make a great song, especially not an inspirational one. So on top of everything we just talked about, the song has the effect that it's had for so long. For instance, here at Tiananmen Square. I remember years ago reading an interview with one of the, I guess you'd say, survivors from there, one of the protesters, uh, and he talked about how they listened to Bob Dylan songs. With just a little bit of internet searching, I found the song associated with several current or recent struggles. And we talked about why that is. You know, how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Well, any oppressed people can relate to that line. And recall we mentioned Stevie Wonder earlier in the video. Well, he was introducing the song live one time and said that, unfortunately, it would always be needed. And because of the way Dylan wrote the lyrics, it's always ready to serve that need whenever it comes up. Another iconic African-American singer of the time, Sam Cooke, was inspired by the song, and I believe it was him. I couldn't find this, but I'm pretty sure I got this right. He was the one who said, you know, a black man should have written this. In fact, that's why he wrote A Change Is Gonna Come after this. I'm going to link to an amazing performance by him, by the way, and it speaks of the power of the song where he's singing. It's the early 60s. It's a black man singing for an all-white audience on TV, and they're these clean-cut white teenagers. And he's got them swaying and dancing, but what they're hearing are words about how long can people who are not oppressed stand by and allow that to be done to others. It's really a remarkable visual to illustrate the central point of the song. How many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The song is, of course, full of questions, but that's actually the central one, even though it's just one of many in there. The song is actually an attack on indifference and apathy. It's always dangerous to take anything that Dylan says literally. He's such a trickster, but I think he's shooting straight when he said, just 21 years old, quote, I still say that some of the biggest criminals are those that turn their heads away when they see wrong and know it's wrong. And yes, he wrote that specifically about blowing in the wind. So the song is a call to action, but not in the typical way where a call to action is kind of preaching to the converted. He seemed to share the outlook of another 60s radical, Martin Luther King, who wrote about the indifferent white population in America. Instead of the overt racists, the oppressors, etc., realizing that if they would take action or listen to their conscience, then the actual oppression could end. To focus a little bit more on the music and singing, by the way, that kind of ties into the fact that the music is at least partly based on an old Negro spiritual called No More Auction Block for Me, which obviously had to do with slavery and which Dylan sang in the coffee houses of New York City, Greenwich Village, when he first arrived. And that's a good example of Dylan's musical recycling, which we talked about in the last video and exists throughout his career. Dylan's singing on the song is fantastic and I think very underrated. You know, he can't identify with these words the way that someone who has actually seen war could, or 
he couldn't identify with the lines about oppression the way that a Stevie Wonder or a Sam Cooke could. But he manages to sound so much older, wiser, and world-weary than he is that it sounds much more authentic than a lot of the versions that came out by his young contemporaries. Well, it could go on, but those are my thoughts on Blowing in the Wind. I said I was going to keep these videos short. Didn't really succeed there, but there's a lot to say, and that was just some of it. So again, keep in mind, this was his first song on his first album of original material. Pretty amazing accomplishment. And a definite sign of things to come. Thanks.